every year. John Jay College gives a justice uh, award to uh, politician, activists, um, from around the world, from the U.S., Supreme Court justice, who've done great things for criminal justice, for the, the, the goal of social justice. And we thought that it was time to also recognize the media. People in the media, whether they're journalists, whether they're artists, or whatever uh, craft, who've also done a lot to uh, improve public knowledge, to provoke debate, um, to um, inspire people, really, to think differently about uh, our criminal justice system and, and the issues that the 21st century system uh, that we know it has to face and addresses. And it's a real honor to be able to deliver our inaugural award to someone like David Sonny. Um And I will let him speak for itself. The, the, the video tells you a little bit about why we did it. And to enlarge upon that, we've got a special guest to introduce David, uh, Terrence McClarney, uh, who is probably one of Baltimore's legendary detectives. Uh, when we asked David, who's the best person to introduce you, we thought of all sorts of movie stars, Angelina Jolie, maybe. <laughs> but no, he picked Terry McCarty. So, Terry, spotlight. <laughs> and Mr. Hamilton mentioned the Super Bowl, so I just I got to throw that out there. <laughs> said, what are, you going to, what are you going to talk about? And I told her some of it, and she said, Terry, you can't do that. It's not a roast. <laughs> so I thought, okay. But let me start. I think his, David's contribution to criminal justice, you have to have a little bit of a historical perspective. So I want to describe briefly what it was like to work in West Baltimore, which is, has the corner, the corner that he spoke of or wrote about in 76 through 80s. So I wasn't from Baltimore, so there was, a, there was a culture shock. It was sad. It was just sad. I would, you would see just, it was mean, it was, it was dirty, there was hopelessness, crime, drugs, violence was just everywhere. Stupid violence. Just stupid violence. You know, eight beer violence. And so I was riding around and I'm thinking, no, this, you know, wonder how long this will go on, how many years this will continue to be what this is. And one of the guys in my squad was in his 50s, mid-50s, and he'd been in the same area for over 20 years. And I said to him, you know, uh, and he would always say, hey, I locked up his father. Now I'm locking him up. And so I said, you know, what was it like 20 years ago? He said it was like this. I thought, well, it hasn't gotten any better. He said, no, it's not get, it hasn't gotten any better. It's not going to get any better in your lifetime. Just drive. Just drive the car. That's your job. So, you know, back then we didn't have tasers. We didn't have mace. We hit people with sticks and with slapjacks. We actually had slapjack pockets in our police pants. It's a little it's a piece of lead with leather and a little holder. And it's actually a good weapon because it's like an extension of your fist. And you can also hold the gun in that hand. So we used slapjacks. We hit people with sticks. The people went to jail. By, you know, just They went to jail. There were acts of kindness. There were times when the police were surprisingly kind. But there was a resignation. It was just like, this is it. You know, you do your nine hours and go home safe. This is it. This is what it's always going to be. Then, and I would mention the guys I went to school with who were not cops. And I would tell them. And they would think, well, you know, get another job. You know, that really sounds bad. Why are you doing that? You know, but they didn't care. No one cared. The churches cared. Some ministers really cared. The media once in a while would write something that, you know, I would read and think, oh, they're, they're starting, you know, there's a good article. No one read it. No one cared. Only the people there care. Now, part of that was in this film. So let me jump ahead 10 years. Now it's the mid-80s, and I'm in homicide. And it was the same thing except different. No one cared about that. 
we would have, there's only 620,000 people in Baltimore, we'd have 300 murders. No one cared. They cared if someone important got killed, which was rare, and they cared if children got killed, or here's the worst thing, if you had a real victim, we came to distinguish real victims, an elderly woman in her house beaten to death. There's a real victim. You go to that detective's desk and you say, what do you have? Can I, can I help you? That night you pick up a drug dealer whose gun is halfway out of his dip. You try to solve it because you want a good clearance rate. But they weren't really like people. You know, just the, the you know, we call them real victims, so obviously the flip side is you have non-real victims. And that was the vast, vast majority. So along comes David Simon. And believe me, I'm not talking Sister Teresa here. It's still like pretty much like it was. But David comes and spends a year at the homicide unit. And I, I'll get to it later, what I think that did and why his contribution is important. But first, let me tell you about that year. They tell us a reporter from the Sun paper is coming. You might as well have said they're flying in from Moscow to us. And, you know, and we're thinking, no, no way, even our boss, bosses aren't that stupid. And then David shows up, and he has the earring, and you saw his mugshot. And so immediately we're going, well, you know, they're crazy to let him do this. We'll just ignore him. So that we tried that for a little while, but David was very persistent. And then we thought, he won't do this. He won't write a book. He'll be here a month, he'll write a newspaper or a magazine article, he'll be gone. So, but that's not what happened. He was there in the 4 a.m. when we would go on raids. He was on the scenes. He was at the autopsies. He was with, when we talked to the families. He dressed like he was on a permanent vacation. But still, officers would approach him and start telling him things at crime scenes. And he would always say, I'm not a detective. But they would keep talking to him. And I think they were thinking, well, neither are the rest of those guys. But, so David did the year. And, you know, he, and he took a lot of abuse from us. I'll just tell you one story. One we had, we got, we made a big case. We went out to get, we went out to drink. So David comes with us, first time. He said, Simon's coming. But he got used to him. You know, everywhere you turned, there he was. And we didn't have the interview room. They didn't have the viewing portals. So you had to open the door slowly because he was listening through the, the little door jam area. And we just got used to him always being there. So we were sort of like, you know, he's always here. So we're out drinking. And Dave starts to mumble a little bit. And he's looking off weird. And someone said, what's, what's wrong with him? Is he sick? And I said, I think he's drunk. And uh, the guy said, how can he be drunk? He only had two beers. And I said, well, he's drunk. And so he kind of had to like him after that. So, but he stuck with us for the year, and then he disappeared. The guy was saying, see, he's not writing a book. Whoever fronted him that money's a moron because they're never going to get it back. So, of course, that was a mistake. So how comes the homicide book? And our careers all took a little trash. Apparently, and I know Chief Pratt here, but I'm glad that Commissioner Batts is not. But, uh, yeah, we curse. We talk like that. And it's a very earthy group of men. And uh, that, that's true. But somehow the uh, command staff was amazed at that, that we would talk like that to each other. But we did. But that sort of passed. But I want to talk about the corner for just a second. When I read the corner, this is a huge compliment. People would say to me, is a homicide realistic? I said, yeah, it is. It is. But when I got to about page 20 of the corner, I just thought, God, oh, this is my day off. And this is just like being at work. And it was. That's how truthful, I mean, accurate that was. The Wire, my wife refused to watch it because the language is so bad. But, so she wouldn't even watch it. And, uh, but I think what I'm saying is, before that, some people were interested in the problem in that dark little part of the city, that, that violent little place where, you know, it was easy just not to pay any attention to it if you weren't there. But after everyone started watching these things in their living room, I think the conversation got much larger and more people were interested. And I think that's the contribution 
that they've made. Um, I think you'll know in the media that people you'd like to say shine a light on it, open a window or whatever. But and he did shine a light on it, you know, a huge light. And so you have people talking about it who just didn't care otherwise. And I think that's the main contribution. I have a real problem with the MacArthur Award, the, the Genius Award. Uh, my phone didn't stop for days. Every retired homicide man in, in Baltimore was going, holy oh, cow. Yeah. How can that be? Uh, and I said, well, it's a different group of people making those decisions. <laughs> We've remained friends. We've been friends for 25 years. Not a popular thing in the city of Baltimore to be friends with David Simon. And to that I say, don't kill the messenger. Uh, as I said, there it could be any town, but it just happened to be Baltimore that, that brought it out. And to end, I just want to... Uh, uh, there's a police officer who was shot twice in the head. Blind. That was in 87. Last year, he developed hepatitis C, which you see more of that because all the blood transfusions were before um, they screened for hepatitis C, AIDS, etc., etc. So we're trying to get a thing going to get a live donor. He ended up having to have a complete liver because it just he went south too fast. But so we thought, okay, we'll get the Sun paper to write something. And uh, that's great. And then that'll drum up people who are interested in doing this, being a live donor. You get them half your liver. You, everyone lives. You grow your liver back. I mean, you, there's one or two percent of fatal. You may die. Um, so I called David. He's down in this about a year ago, around Mardi Gras time. He's in New Orleans. And I said, David, uh, and I explained it to him. And so David said, I'll be there tomorrow. So, I have to say that, David. Yeah, I said something nice. But, so, I, a lot of my stuff I was going to say, you know, I can't say it because of my wife. And, uh, you know, which is probably good because, you know, he is very, uh, you know, he's a talented man. We don't agree on very much. But I, you know, I think we agree on, you know, the state of crime in these inner city areas that was just just a cycle of despair just going on and on and on. I think maybe things are a little better because of what he's done. David? David, it's a real honor to give you the first John Jay Trailblazer so Award, 2003. So when I asked Terry to introduce me, I really was expecting a roast. Uh, to anybody who's managed to get a hold of the re-released uh, copy of Homicide uh, after its 15th year uh, anniversary, um, they re-released it with a different afterword. Um, what happened to the detectives, what happened with the casework it was still outstanding. And I asked Terry, um, knowing how, how genuinely funny and how insightful he is, uh, despite the way he pretends, um, I asked him to write an after afterward and give the detectives the last word, and I knew it would be great. And it was. Um, although I beg to differ, I got drunk after three years. <laughs> um, but... You know, in, in a very real sense, um, I'm glad he's here because, uh, and actually some of the other winners touched on it as well, uh, I owe a real debt of gratitude to anybody who talked to me, uh, not just within the homicide unit in that year, that, of course them, that they, that they had 365 days of, of, uh, of, of uh, voyeurism and, and The irritation, uh, and they, they carried it very stoically, and, and indeed, after the book came out, there was a lot of, uh, there was a sort of a tensing, a collective tensing of the Baltimore Police Department uh, that uh, worried me. Terry 
being Terry and being very funny, he uh, he wrote another chapter and sent it to me at the paper. Yeah, I don't know if you remember this. The chapter was only a half a page long, but it was it had the, the exact chapter number. I don't know if I don't remember. That. There were twelve chapters in Homicide, one for each month. And chapter thirteen came to me at the office, Baltimore Sun, and it said, "Well, they've all been transferred." <laughs> I think I see now what they were trying to tell me about the department. So um, it wasn't quite that bad, but there was a ten tense moment. And um, <clears throat> these guys did what they did, uh, and they said what they said. And on some level, they knew, and this was something that was conveyed to me very early, that they were very proud to be who they were and what, doing what they were doing. There's a lot that you can argue about law enforcement uh, from, from a uh, policy perspective. I am as, we don't need to go into it tonight, but I am as adversarial to the idea of a drug war as you could possibly be at this point. I'm radicalized uh, to the point where if they picked me to be on a jury, I would try to nullify that jury uh, for a nonviolent drug offense. But nobody doesn't want somebody to go out when somebody's killed and find the right guy and lock him up. Um, it's the purest form of police work uh, you can imagine in terms of what's required, what society demands. Um, so on some level, these guys knew we're not doing anything we're ashamed of. In fact, we know we're doing our jobs for the most part. Um, the clearance rate was above the national average back then, and uh, they, were, they were getting their convictions in court where they needed to. And so the department, although you know, Terry made a good joke about it, the department sort of knew they were putting me in probably one of their best units. Still, there's an incredible amount of personal risk to talking to her. These guys open themselves up. So did the people on the drug corner. Uh, so did, to, to carry to extend it even further, so did people in New Orleans when we were doing a fictional piece, but we were trying to root it in the reality of post Katrina New Orleans. Um, the people, uh, the, the recon Marines, uh, they, those were all the real names of the Marines we used in, in Generation Kill, and that was because they opened themselves up to another reporter, Evan Wright of Rolling Stone, who then later wrote the book. Um, and you can imagine how hierarchical the Marine Corps is. When that book came out, and certainly when the miniseries came out, there was some hell to pay. Um, there is no getting around the extraordinary trust that is required to talk to a reporter, uh, increasingly in this society, um, where uh, institutions are asserting over their reputation and their, 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 their standing um, in, in ever greater ways. Uh, so I owe a real debt to the detectives uh, themselves for having launched me on this absurd course that I'm on. Which brings me to the absurd course I'm on. Um, I always thought I'd just be a reporter. Maybe I'd write some books and then go back to the newspaper, a better reporter. But I always thought newspapers would be there. But that's how I would end. <coughs> um, after your legs go, you're on the copy desk, irritating young reporters, and bumming cigarettes, and telling them what it was like to work with Mencken and Manchester, <laughs> Mark Twain, you know, um, but it didn't work out that way. So you know, weird things happened, and Homicide got made in a television show, and my newspaper started to go south in terms of what the editors there valued. Um, long before the internet showed up, I mean, the demonology now, if you're in newspapers, is that it's the internet. You know, we were just doing our jobs. We were we were making the world safe for democracy through journalism, and, and then. The delivery system changed, and the economics changed, and we were all thrown out on our ass. Um, but we're more complicit than that. You know, I, my buyout was in 95, long before the internet mattered to anybody. Uh, in 95, I left the Baltimore Sun. I was the third buyout under uh, Time, Time Warner, which, when we were bought by out-of-town ownership, Time Warner, they all, they all said, oh, that's a good one. You got bought by the good one. Thank God you're not going to thank, thank God you're not. No, there were no good ones. Newspapers were supposed to be locally owned. They were supposed to have a public trust. There was a lot that was implied in newspapers that obviously wasn't true. So I ended up stumbling almost backwards without even thinking I would stay in television. I ended up stumbling into a job on the television show about the, the detectives. And uh, I thought, well, I'll do this while I finish the second book because I need another year to go through that manuscript. And then I'll go get a job at whatever newspaper is the, the better place to go. I had some standing offers. And never thought I'd leave. And then, you know, what can I tell you? HBO's kind of like a crack pipe. <laughs> <laughs> I, made about, I made about 110 hours of television now, and I'm still thinking, maybe it's time to stop. 
admit that I'm not a newspaper reporter. <laughs> but the one thing, the other reason I wanted to have Terry here today is, you know, you, you make a nice film about me, and I look at it, and I see these these hyperbolic statements, and, and I get to come to nice awards dinners, and people give me awards. You know, stick around long enough, and, and you know, uh, what's that? Uh, it's a profane clash lyric from my youth that I probably shouldn't use, but we're all adults here. Uh, there's a song called Death or Glory by my favorite punk band when I was in college. And it's a, it has a, uh, a line that says, he who fucks nuns will later join the church. And that's, that's kind of how it feels. It feels like, you know, I was just a guy, an ink-stained rat, shooting my feet up on the desk, arguing with Terry over why he couldn't have given me, you know, three or four facts so I could have filed before my home final deadline, and, you know, and, and, and that's how it was supposed to go. And then the next minute, I'm, you know, you know, well, I don't know if you know this, uh, but I do love to read a lot of history, and, and uh, in the good old days of the, of the declining Roman Empire, um, and even at the height of the empire, when, uh, when commanders and, and generals would come back from, from, from a war in the, uh, in the hinterlands, and they would, they would have their cap, they would give them a, a triumph, in the Colosseum, and they would march their, their captives into the Colosseum before them with the legion behind them and all of their uh, assorted, uh, the ensigns of their the captured commands that they, they had defeated, and there would be this rousing cheer, and they would look around at this incredible spectacle of Rome honoring them. They would always require a, uh, a servant, a slave, even, to walk right behind the general whisper in his ear, uh, you're not a god, you're not a god. So whenever I get invited to one of these things from now on, what I really wanted and what I'm disappointed in Catherine McClarney <laughs> for is, I really think I need Terry McClarney off my left shoulder saying, you're still an asshole. You're still an asshole. You're still an asshole. Because uh, he knows. He, he remembers. And somebody's got to be there to remind me. Um, having said that, I want to congratulate the, the winners who did real journalism and are being honored today. I, I, I am famous for speaking ill of the prize culture, uh, but actually my, my point is actually a little more nuanced, nuanced than that, I hope. And it's this. If you do the story because you think it's a story, and because you think it has merit and ought to be told, that's great. And if you do the story, um, if, if in December or January, whenever you look back on the work you did for a year, you say to yourself, Hey, I did some good work this year. Maybe I'll put this up for a prize. That's great. You know, if you're thinking about the prize you're going to put it up for in February when you're planning the project, then you're an asshole and you're part of the problem. So it's really simple. I mean, if we're all in journalism, let's speak the truth. You know, uh, I watched a lot of stuff get manufactured at newspapers, and that's what I was objecting to. The idea that somebody did some good work and gets honored for it. Um, specifically, the piece in the Picayune. Uh, I read it contemporaneously when it ran, and I have to say, um, it, it, it dovetails precisely with, with the arguments that, that I've been making for a long time now about um, the why. Uh, journalism is, any 14-year-old who's smart can do, can do basic journalism, by which I mean to say who, what, when, where, how. Um, that's really, you know, recounting what happened yesterday is, uh, is is an easy enough gig for anybody who's literate and sentient. The why is what makes journalism an adult, uh, an adult sport. It, it, it's what makes journalism a, a meaningful way to spend an, an adult life and not be ashamed of yourself. The why is epic. And looking at, you know, starting with the premise of why is Louisiana become the, the American gulag? Why, why are we incarcerating our residents at this incredible rate? And why is America the world's gulag? Why are we incarcerating people in this incredible way? Uh, Senator Webb, uh, who is now leaving government, very tellingly, uh, he, had, um, he had an article uh, ran, I guess, a couple years ago in Parade, and he asked the question the other way. He said, or he made a statement the other way. He said, either we as Americans are the most evil people on the planet, or we're doing something wrong. And, and there's no other way to, to, to think about it. Um, the drug war has led us to some dramatic places that, that we never thought we would go as a democracy. And to ask the question from the point of view of the, of the Times-Picayune, 
of why has our state become this, and then to work backwards from that so that the whole, you know, you're spending a year not trying to play gotcha journalism, not looking for, a, 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 you know, the one bad uh, player who if you just elect the right guy, you'll fix everything. You know, that, that game is, that game is, is, is not only fraught, but, but fraudulent. Um, but to look systemically and say, how did we get here? To, to, to engage the why is epic. And so I'm, I'm very proud to be honored on the same night. And not, you know, no disrespect to anybody else, but that one, having been working down in New Orleans and trying to make Treme a narrative about what, what went right and what went wrong after Katrina, um, I only regret that I can't get five seasons out of the show because uh, this last season we're actually doing some of the conditions over at OPP, in the, the, the parish prison. And uh, we ran, we were running out of road, otherwise I would actually get into the for-profit aspect. The idea that government, the government, wouldn't be the actual arbiter, in a very real sense, of when we decide to incarcerate fellow Americans. That, that, that the guy in black robes wouldn't be thinking only that to take, deprive somebody of their freedom for 10, 15, 20 lifetimes. Is a, uh, is a failure. It's a failure of society. So if we're going to go there, make sure this is for the public safety, and don't let anything, uh, don't let any other factor land it. And yet these for-profit prison companies are lobbying legislatures for three strikes and you're outlaws, for, for, for more draconian drug laws, for more draconian immigration uh, detentions. I mean, the, 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 the two growth populations are nonviolent drug offenders and people trying to, you know, move to a better life. Legal immigrants. That's who. That's the population group. You know, when I started as a reporter, the federal prison system, 34% of the inmates were from there for violent offenses. That federal prison system is, is sort of supposed to be the high end. Now that number is 7%. So, you know, this is it's a nightmare. And and you know, to the extent that we don't resist it, it's going to get worse. So I'm very proud to be honored, in particular, on the same night as that. And I think your remarks about where everybody went who worked on that. You know, it's, we all know that. If you, if, you, if you worked on a regional paper, you've watched the journalism disappear. And it's very frightening. And at some point, I believe it will come back. I'll be a little, I'll end on a little note of optimism here because I think it's necessary and I think a certain percentage of the population misses it and wants it. And what will ultimately happen is they will figure out what should have been figured out about 20 years ago, which is uh, this has value. This has value uh, to people who need to, need to know these things and who want to know these things. And they need to find a way to, 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 to get it paid for online. And, and you're already seeing that with the New York Times and the Washington Post. And the, the pay model will happen. It's a shame that they had to walk five-sixths of, of quality journalism out the door before they figured that out, but I think they will figure it out. Um, so thank you for this. Um, it's, you know, again, uh, I feel like an apostate. I feel like I was supposed to stay in journalism and that a lot, a lot went wrong uh, in, a, in a moral sense and that anybody in the entertainment industry who gets to pontificate like this is really just dipped in shit. So, <laughs> um, you know, would that Terry McGuinney had told you more truth and a little less hyperbole, it would be, the evening would be a little more balanced, but he's a man of great grace, so, despite his uh, inclination. Thank you. They see an awful lot. And, 
they, 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 their view of humanity tends to become uh, dark and not without evidence. Uh, but you know, Terry's Terry's very playful uh, with the human condition. There are two there are two moments that I prize above all others. One is of which is we were watching Donald Morton. He's a very good detective. He looks like a big polar bear, and, and he's very he leaves these long gaps in the conversation, which if you're a reporter, you know, is a very effective way of getting people to keep talking. You know, you just don't, you don't give back enough and then the person wants to fill the space. Donald's a master of that because he's not very verbal, um, but he's a really good detective. Anyway, we were watching a question, this 14-year-old kid from West Baltimore uh, on, uh, on a murder. And it was, it was actually at a desk. It wasn't in the interrogation room. It was at the desk in the coffee room. And Terry is sitting across from me. And Donald is just staring, he's his mustache, he's just you know, leaning over this 14-year-old kid, and he's just looking at him, and the kid is starting to babble because he's so uncomfortable. And Terry looks at me, he scrawls on a little piece of note paper, and he hands it to me. And, and while, while we're watching the kid sort of die in front of Donald Warden, I, I pick up the note, I look at it, and it says, wouldn't you hate to have Donald Warden as a father? <laughs> It just, it, like, you know, it's just, I don't know how that didn't make the book. It was just beautiful. Um, and then the other thing that I, I do remember is, uh, well, I'll save that one. I'll save that one. Um, no, I won't save that one. Um, I, I once was talking to Terry about uh, cases and, you know, why he, why he did what he did. He made seven quick jokes in a row because he didn't want to tell me anything honest. You know, he asked a question like that. But then he went to the files and he got out a case from 1982. This is when I was just getting to know him in, 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 in must have been March or April. He got out of, uh, it was the Bronstein case um, from 82 of, a, of an elderly couple who was murdered in a home invasion, Robert. Terry worked that case and he got, uh, he got the right guys um, and got the conviction. And uh, it was a really startling murder. And he said, he said something, I was looking through the crime scene photos and, and the, this elderly couple, they had gone back in the house time after time to get more stuff out of the house while, after they'd killed the couple. And they had put pillowcases, if I'm remembering this correctly, over the faces of, of, of Ronstein and his wife. And Terry was looking at, at, the, at the photos, and he said something that was so not detective. It was so human. He said, I don't mean that in a bad way, because I really do respect the police work and detectives, but he said something that was sort of extraordinary. He said, don't the following photos really bother you? Is there something really disturbing about these photos? And and there was. I mean, you know, a lot of it, a lot of what, you know, that's a room with 10,000 murders in it, or you know, maybe 5,000 murders, most of them gone out of the microphone. There, there's photos in every one. There's dead bodies in every one. It wasn't a mere fact. It was, there was something, there was a real betrayal of common humanity. You know, I did I'm just going to cover you up while I, while I come back and take your stereo. There was something really bothersome about those photos. Um, and in showing them, Terry was trying to convey something that I didn't often hear. Um, he was, you know, that's the fascinating thing about, about knowing him, is that, uh, is watching him sort of compute humanity through his daily job. It was, it was, he, he didn't take the easy way. I've always admired him. Ah, we've got some questions. Okay. Um, there's a microphone right there. Uh, you're, you're joking, I don't think um, about, you know, feeling bad about leaving journals and, and stuff, um, but as somebody who admires your work, I've always kind of had the impression that you um, found a medium that you thought was a better way to tell that complicated story of social systems um, that you, you know, talked about earlier, trying to tell through journalism, so I'm curious, you know, well, if that's true. I what? get to make it up now, so I get, I get to shape it to say exactly what I want. In that sense, it's more of an editorial, but it's not even that. Uh, I have too much respect for journalism to compare uh, anything fiction to that. And in fact, you know, one of our systemic problems with journalism is the number of people who are so hungry for the perfect narrative that they will shape a uh, fact into even partial fiction or even whole cloth in order to achieve the perfect narrative, um, which is disturbing in every sense. And 
it's not a unique thing. Every newspaper that anyone's worked in, you can name one or two guys who were always cooking. Everybody knew who they were. Um, so I'm not going to be the guy who takes an eraser and sort of blots out that line between fact and fiction. Um, I ended up where I ended up by accident. Uh, and I'm not particularly suited to the entertainment industry. I mean, I will inform you that uh, none of these shows gleaned much of an audience while they were on. Uh, in fact, I'm, I've got about as far as you can go in, in television entertainment without having an audience. You know, it's, it's, it's been a remarkable, you know. I mean, but listen, other showrunners were saying, you know, that they're, they got to put on, you know, sex and taking time bombs and blowing stuff up and, you know, and being hyperbolic about everything. And I keep making shows where nothing seemingly happens until we're, you figure out something happened but only at the end of the run. And that, um, you know, there's a lot that I'd resent it if, if, if I had to do all the other stuff to get on. I, I can't explain to you the weird window that HBO allowed me. But, you know, at some point even they're going to get tired. So, I, I know that, that I don't, I, I'm not even saying I could make a more popular show if, if I knew how. I'm not sure I could. But I will, I will say that even if I did know how, I probably wouldn't do it. I am more interested in what really happened in New Orleans um, after the storm than I am in shaping a perfect narrative that, that is dramatically hyperbolic. You know? I don't want to have Tony Burnett, the lawyer character, who's doing civil rights, rights cases, I don't want to have her have a Paul Newman-like uh, verdict, if you remember that movie, ending, you know, of, of righteous... I don't want to give that kind of release to the audience because that kind of release didn't exist in New Orleans. You know, the police department is still under a consent decree down there. And now the mayor, who has ambitions of his own, he doesn't actually want to do the hard work of reforming that police department, which is among the worst and most corrupt in America. He wants to get rid of this consent decree because he doesn't have the money to do the hard You know, When it came time to appoint a police commissioner, to clean that, that mess of the police department was killing people left and right uh, from before the storm and, and, and was was one of the most volatile and corrupt uh, institutions in, in, in America. And when, when the, the new reformist mayor took over, he, he appointed somebody who, who had a history in the department. He didn't come outside. He didn't get a deputy commissioner from New York or L.A. or someplace to come in and do the hard work of cleaning house and starting over and establishing a, you know, I take back every... Terry, I take back every criticism I ever made of the Baltimore Police Department. You guys are, you know, you guys are a solid C average. <laughs> C plus. C plus. No, it was a, it's an astonishing thing. And, you know, for me to make a television show where somebody triumphs over this, when in fact nobody has triumphed over it yet, and now the, the mayor, thinking, you know, I need, to, I need to solve a problem without solving a problem, he wants the consent decree to go away without having done the hard work of performing that police department. So you look at it, you look at the reality there, and, and the, the guy who's a reporter, he gets all tangled up. And he says, "Okay, I can't have the ending that would make everyone f feel like it was worthwhile to to, to invest in the story." And the only ending I want is the one that, that is credible to to the fact on the ground. That's a terrible way to think if you're trying to make television. Believe me, that's a that's a crippling disease. Uh, it's, the, it's the repertory. Should they have a voice from Philadelphia? Yes, uh, Mr. Simon, I heard you get the go to Donnie Andrews to put on the stand. He's up, of course. You and, get him uh, I thought I had all my minister's voice, maybe you could hear. <laughs> um, <laughs> and there was a humanizing in your eulogy of him, obviously from a different perspective of your humanizing of the police department. I'm wondering if you could talk about that tonight. Donnie, uh, Donnie was one of the prototypes, or templates, I should say, for the character Omar. Um, he was a, a, a guy who robbed drug dealers. He, he had a good 15, 18-year run doing that, off and on. Then eventually he went to work for a drug dealer uh, who was paying him sort of on smack just to be muscle. And he managed not to kill anybody while pretending to kill people. Uh, Donnie was his own weird creature, but he, he, he actually once cut out a brief from the Baltimore Sun murder. And they didn't know, the, they only knew the street name of the guy that they were trying to kill. He was, a, he was a drug war in 86. And he cut out a little brief and he got paid for the contract by saying this, this was for Fruit Loop. This is, we killed Fruit Loop. It was just a brief in the paper.
Fruitland. Fruitland had been locked up two days before, and he figured he would, the guy wouldn't hear him. So Donnie was sort of torn along, violent guy, but he ended up eventually killing somebody for this drug deal anymore in Bordley. And it actually bothered him in a way that you wouldn't expect after that kind of a life you'd be bothered. And I'm not saying Donnie didn't shoot anybody or kill anybody before. I honestly don't know, but I suspect he did. But it, it was all in the game. He, he robbed drug dealers. If it, you know, if, if it came to a shootout, he would shoot them. But this was on contract, somebody who he didn't have a beef with, and it bothered him, and it broke him in a way, so that he became a cooperator. And he accepted a sentence of what he thought was 10, 10 years, and if he did everything right in prison, he would, he would make his first parole um, in 1987. And, uh, and 10 years later, nobody was there for him. All the people who promised to be there for him weren't there for him, except Ed Burns made that case. And Ed Burns, and then later the, prosecutor, the federal prosecutor put Donnie away. Uh, they all started trying to get Donnie out of prison. And by, he did 17 years. He got out of prison. Um, and he, he spent basically the rest of his life trying to give back. Trying, he was ashamed of his life. He, he, was, he was proud of it for having survived it, but he was ashamed of the damage he'd done. And he spent the rest of his life trying to figure out ways to inject some good back into the neighborhoods where he had been predatory. Uh, and that, that, that was to be admired. And, and um, I got to know Donnie very well. He became a very close friend. Uh, and, and he died just recently. Of, uh, you know, he was up here in New York for an event. And he actually had a heart attack. Um, he's, uh, you know, that wasn't just me. I mean, Ed, here's Ed Burns, the guy who locked him up, who figured out that this guy was deserved a second chance. Charlie Shearer, the prosecutor. The FBI agent who was the assistant on the case spoke at his parole hearing. Um, eventually, the University of Maryland got involved. And finally, a couple of Terry's colleagues, uh, Donald Warden and Kevin Davis, uh, figured out that while there was no way to get Donnie out on a reduction, the only way they could do it was a reduction of sentence. So they actually went back and documented the fact that they had gone out to talk to Donnie 10 years earlier in federal prison, and Donnie had helped them clear up some other murders. And in writing those reports, there was actually a new piece of evidentiary material that they could request a hearing from the federal judge who finally did the right thing. So, again, nobody fits into any category. And whenever, I'll say this too, whenever I'm trashing the drug war, and boy, am I always trashing the drug war, um, I always make a point of, I'm glad I was in the clip of, you know, I start from a position of admiring good police. You know, it's not... No, no, we're all people. Nobody's the end. Uh, I'm really un uninterested in, 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 in reporting or in storytelling in which all the cops are bad or all the drug dealers are bad or all the politicians are bad or everybody starts from a position of nasty. I don't believe it. Uh, I've met very few sociopaths in life. Uh, and, I, and I've seen very few operate. You know, I know a lot of people who make a lot of mistakes. A lot of people do the wrong thing. A lot of people are at times selfish and then in the next moment um, quite human. Given. And it's in trying to capture that that I think uh, reporting becomes interesting, and storytelling becomes interesting. So you know, Donnie was Donnie was a better man than his resume would have otherwise argued. And and you know I, I, I just I think the, the labels itself often tangle us up. My school newspaper uh, is the John Jay Sentinel. Uh, before I ask you my question, I wanted to know if you were happy the Ravens won the Super Bowl. I was at the Super Bowl uh, with my son. Um, I was very happy. Uh, well, I was, I was ecstatic for the first half, and then I was abjectly terrified uh, because when they came out after the, the light of the light, they were flat. And then I was ecstatic. And um, I, it was, I ran the gamut of emotions, as they say, from A to B. And, um, <laughs> I, I can't believe it mattered that much to me. I mean, on, on some level, I can stand back from it and go, this is just a spectacle, you know, of, you know, I can't help it, you know. I, I'm stuck in the same curve as everybody else. You know, I want to see the game on Sunday. And, and I was, I walked away from the Super Bowl last night thinking, you know, how much fun did I just have, you know, over, you know, over whether, you know, athletes.
athletes represent, you know, representing in some vague way two separate franchises in two separate <laughs> cities. You know, in a game of, 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 of no gladiatorial contest. <laughs> but um, he took it to the reality show. I cared. I, I did not want to go to the Super Bowl and see what it was. I wanted ready to go there. There's your answer. <laughs> well, my question is, uh, do you think the show The Wire had a positive effect on the streets of Baltimore? And uh, out of all your works, can you give me your favorite one? Uh, my favorite work, because I think it was the best executed, and, it, and it, it, it did exactly what we intended to do, and we were absolutely accurate to the story, so much so that we could use the real names of everybody in the story, including those who don't come off as well as others, was Generation Kill. And that's not even my reporting, that's Evan Wright's reporting. In fact, I think we were probably more devotional to the book because it wasn't my reporting. Right? I felt as if I could, you know, I'm, I'm representing somebody else's journalism, and very good journalism it was. So everything that happened in those in that month period where you're you're with uh, Bravo platoon for a brief moment too uh, is what happened. Um, and and, and you know, we, we we were not going to use the names of real. U.S. Marines and not the active side. So to me, I guess the less people who watch it, the better. <laughs> because, because, you know, I think, I think that, you know, it's funny, a director uh, who directed both some episodes of Treme and he's a British director and also directed half the episodes of Generation Kill, when he got to the set of Treme, he said, well, Simon, you made the last one for exactly 26 recon Marines. That was your audience. That's the only people you cared about. This, you seem to be making it for about 250 street musicians and, 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 and brass band players and, 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 and sous chefs in New Orleans. So by that standard, you, you've positively become a populist. Um, I, I think that was probably the best executed thing I ever wanted. And it was not just me, it was obviously a lot of different people. Um, what was the first part of that? The wire had a positive. Um, I, I think Terry's right about it. at least people are arguing about what, what was happening. And, and we haven't had a policy about what, about the other America um, for most of the last 30, 40 years, not since the end of the war. And, and at least they were getting some screen time. You know, there's there's 629 comedies and dramas and reality shows about one America, and somebody made a drama about the other America. And I guess I, I never felt more proud than when a guy like Andre Royal who played Bubbles or Michael Kay or, or, or Wendell as, as who played a detective, um, they would come out of their trailers in West Baltimore. And the trailers would be parked on like Schroeder Street or Cary Street, you know, where there's been no economic activity since the factories closed for 35 years other than the drug trade and, you know, maybe a corner laundromat. It's, it's, the, it's the forgotten part of America. And these, by season three, by season four, they would come out of the, the trailers, <coughs> and residents of West Baltimore would come up and just wanted to hug them. I mean, there was a connection that the other America felt to that show that was just delightful, and, and, and not at all surprising to me, but I was just proud to be a bystander to it. And people would talk to, to Andre and say, I know, I know you're going to get off air. I know you're, you know, you're doing all the right things. <laughs> And they'd, they'd say, they'd say, you know, a, a woman walked up to Wendell Pierce who played Bunk and said, "This, this actually happened in, in, in Atlanta Airport." She goes, "She goes, you're the kind of police that I always, you know, I always hope is out there." And I just, I'm really proud of how you play that part. It's just, you know, why did you have to sleep with me? Because of that one scene where they joke about having uh, having sex with each other, which is a verbatim scene that I recorded in my notepad between Terry <laughs> and his former partner in control, or his side partner in control, Bob Gallus. Happy to Kavanaugh's. The two of them are joking about, you know, about why they respect each other. It lapses into some sort of grandly and hilariously homoerotic. And I'm sitting there with my notepad thinking, I couldn't make this up, and it's sheer poetry. And so I gave it to McNulton, and so... Yeah, a woman who literally took it literally walked up to Wendell in the Atlanta airport and said, well, why'd you have to sleep with that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't see that as being right. So, yeah, but you can only go so far. Bro. We have time for just maybe one more very, very quick question. And, uh, there is. I, I have. asked you the... You lose. <laughs> 
Okay, so I'm working on a story about uh, Washington, D.C. police uh, mishandling sexual assault cases, uh, unfounding them, discouraging from reporting, categorizing them as miscellaneous. It's happened in many cities around the country, and as I'm reporting it, I keep thinking of the line from The Wire, juking the stats. And I wonder, you know, your perspective on policing, is there a way to do policing that isn't, that isn't uh, so connected to the statistics and winning the numbers? You need statistics on some level. Um, but you know everything from when when, when you set up a, a, a when you set up a framework by which statistics are, are being used as a measurement for accomplishment, and by which uh, personal careers are dependent upon that kind of accomplishment. Uh, you know everything from Comstat in, in, a, in a formal sense to you know, clearance rates and everything. Um, there's five guys in the basement trying to figure out how to how to make it better without actually making it better. It, it, it's not an organized, it, it, institutions tend to this. They tend to resort to. Um, and sometimes it can get recommendations. Look, there's a guy who's now the governor of Maryland who's going to be wanting to run for president in four years. And if you go back and you look at, if you were to take the sequential CC numbers of all the police reports taken in Baltimore in the years where he was in seeking to become governor, crime in Baltimore to go down dramatically, you are going to find so many unfounded reports uh, for, for, uh, for part two felonies. And then if you go back and you find the living complainants in those reports, you ask them why it was unfounded, you're going to be shocked to see how it, it was known that it was happening. Supervisors who were very honorable uh, police officers were coming to us and saying they're making crime go away on paper. So sometimes it's mendacious, but sometimes... Sometimes it just happens because it's just easier. And people find their way to it. Um, and, and some of this has been institutionalized by, sanctioned by the federal government, you know, the way the FBI allows you to report. And don't get me started on prior year clearances. I mean, that game. Um, but every, you know, every institution does this. Journalism does this. You know, what is, you know, what is the Pulitzer other than, you know, sort of a... Uh, Sometimes they give a Pulitzer Prize out, God bless them, it's for the right thing. Sometimes somebody starts on the campaign for a Pulitzer uh, in January, and they're relentless. And, and they're shaping, you know, they're, 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 they're writing stories about uh, uh, committee meetings, and the governor said this, and our, you know, the, the response to our righteous reporting was that, because they need to have impact, and, and they're shaping you know, they're shaping that binder for the It's like every, you know, don't hold yourself above. We all play this game. School systems play it with graduation rates. You know, Baltimore, if you ask the Baltimore school system, you ask those people what, how many people they're graduating, you know, you'll get a, you'll get a, a 55, 60% figure. They're graduating about 22%, 23%. You know, a lot of those are social promotions, meaning they, they're not really diplomas. Um, everybody plays this game. And there's just careers on the line. And the only thing that, that, that will fix it is not internal to the institutions, but it's external. Maybe a police reporter. I didn't ask for that gig, but I got hired by the Sun. I was so happy. I'm working at a big newspaper, and I didn't have to go work in you know, some little town. For, I got hired, man. What beat do you want me to cover? You're going to city cops. Okay. You know. And I, did, I didn't come up for air or ask them. The Sun had like foreign bureaus. They had a Washington bureau. It was a big paper. I never got promoted. I mean, I, I never got promoted. They just left me on the same beat. The stuff that I wrote when I was there one or two or three years, I can't read it now. It's embarrassing. It's, it's all yesterday, this happened. And, you know, I mean, it, it's work been like, but there, I didn't start to do any decent work until I'd been there four or five or six years so that you couldn't put dope in front of the table in front of me anymore for the 12th time and have to be excited because, you know, you, see, you hit 29 spots and sees three guns and, and bag of dope. But when I was a young reporter, those things could, could get me. I just wanted to um, say a few special thanks to people who really helped make this event possible. And, and uh, I want to ask them all to stand up, but I do want to make special mention of our sponsors uh, for this dinner, for this event, and our first um, uh, John J. Trailblazer Award, uh, Goldman Sachs. Um, uh, they want a whole table. I think they're, no, they're, they're, I think they've left or they're not here. HBO, um, 
Fortune Society, Glenn Martin, uh, some of their folks are over there. So you guys take a bow. Uh, New York State Permanent Sentencing Commission. Don't know which table they're at. There you go. Uh, we also uh, wanted to say special thanks to uh, uh, Renati Rene of the Tinker Foundation. Bloomberg, who's not here, um, and with something, an event like this, uh, we've been working a long time on it, and, and it's not the work of one person, four people, it's working with a really amazing team, and the two videos that you saw, uh, the first one on CMCJ, our shameless plug, uh, was done by Lauren Belfer, um, a, a recent student graduate of uh, NYU Tisch, um, Really proud of her work. Um, the um, video documentary on David was done by uh, John Jay's Audiovisual Services. Uh, Paul Brenner and his fantastic team did that, and they are here. Some of us are here, so we should give them a hand. Um, uh, of course, uh, our marketing and development team, and I'm not going to name them all, but it's Whitney Hedberg. Uh, under Jane Rosengarten's uh, um, uh, administration guidance and all her team, are, I don't know if they're all here, but I really, we owe them a huge debt of thanks for putting this all together. So uh, if all of you who are here still can stand, uh, Jane just really, I mean, it's really hard to talk about. And then I, I really have to thank uh, my team. Jesus, it sounds like an industrial management promotion. Um, at Center Media Crime and Justice, uh, who I'll thank separately uh, at the symposium tomorrow, but uh, we also uh, sweated blood over this uh, this event. Um, we're really glad you all come. Um, Karen Zabachnik, who is our deputy director, and uh, Jane Gates, the director of the uh, Crime Report, Ricardo Martinez, our associate, Dave Guest, and Joe Dominic. And all those on this too many connected. So um, I think I've got everybody. Oh yes, and I can't mention my name, but the folks who escorted you up to this uh, fantastic venue were our student ambassadors and student escorts. Uh, I don't know, I think some of them are still here, but even in absentia, please say a note of thanks for all the And then um, last really thanks to you all for coming and we will see you next year.